far. And I, I trust that uh, today's session promises to be equally e interested. To, to get us started, I, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of, of the land where, wherever we join the seminar from today. For me, uh, joining from uh, Horsham in Western Victoria, this is the land of the, the Wachabolok, Jadwa, Jadwa Jali, Wagaya and Jupagolk peoples. I'd like to extend my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and any other elders, of course, who, are, who may be joining us, us today. We recognise their proud traditions, vibrant culture and continued connection to land, water and community. Uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge our, uh, our the support that we get each year for the, for the Biodiversity Seminar and um, the organising committee, we, we work behind the scene to deliver the seminar each year and we, we get a lot of support from a number of, of organisations each year. And this year, we're particularly grateful to Bank Australia, Beringa Gadjin Land Council, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Project Platypus, Trust for Nature, Wimmera Catchment Management Authority, and Yarri Ambiak Land Care Network, and uh, their, their support is uh, received with, with great thanks. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items. Would everyone uh, please make sure that you uh, mute your microphone and please turn off your, your video so we can just limit the, the interruptions during the, the presentations. And uh, of course, not having the cameras uh, re reduces the bandwidth we need and that makes uh, the experience a bit better for everybody. Um, if you're using uh, the MS Teams link, you can ask questions in the meeting chat function and uh, that, that will show up on the right-hand side of, of your screen. Um, I'll co collate the, the questions and ask the popular ones of each presenter at the end of their presentation. So please give a thumbs up to the questions you want to see answered and that will we'll try to make sure that uh, those questions are answered. If you're viewing via YouTube and have a question, please feel free to, to drop an email to Wimmera Biodiversity Seminar at hotmail.com and that uh, that email address has been monitored during the presentations and the questions will be put into the chat function so everybody can see them as well. We're also asking uh, people not to record the, the presentation and uh, we will post some links later on and the presentations will be available through the SWIFT website and uh, just have uh, some of our presenters have asked that they're not recorded and we're respecting those w wishes. And if you have any trouble with the a MS Teams uh, program, please contact us via uh, social media, media messaging or email Memory Biodiversity Seminar at hotmail.com. Or if you can, use the chat function uh, in, in MS Teams and that will work uh, pretty well. I also have to mention um, the uh, the mugs for this year's seminar and the the first 75 registrations are receiving mugs and uh, I can confirm that the, the mugs are now available and the, the lucky recipients will be receiving uh, pick up all delivery information in, in the coming days and um, uh, hopefully you're lucky and you will uh, enjoy receiving one of those mugs. And at the end of each session, we will be uh, providing a link to a, a short online survey. And we would uh, ask that everybody completes this as soon as possible because it helps us plan for next year's uh, event. And I might talk a little bit later about next year's event uh, as well. So, uh, to get on to the 
uh, the important things of, of today. Our theme uh, for this year, is, as I think everybody will know, is uh, from little things. And we, we've been exploring uh, that, that theme over the last uh, five sessions, including today. And today's session is focused on orchids and fungi. So to get things started, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Nushka Rita, who manages the Royal Botanic Gardens Orchid Conservation Program. And this is a really... I'd like to move on to our second speaker this morning. Dr. Alison Puglio is an ecologist and environmental photographer with a focus on fungi. She's very active in Australia and international fungal conservation, and her writing and images appear on both academic and popular literature. And uh, you can go to alisonpulio.com for more information. Her recent book, The Allure of Fungi, poses fundamental questions about human fungus liaisons. So, uh, Alison, if I could turn over to you now. Thanks, Dean. Can you hear me okay? Muted myself. Yes, Alison, thank you. We can hear you well. Terrific. That's great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dean. And thank you also very much, Annie, for this opportunity to come along and give this seminar today. I'm really thrilled that you've had the insight to include fungi in your biodiversity series because we know very much that our notions of what biodiversity is or what, what nature is or what conservation is has very much focused on flora, plants and fauna animals. And the third kingdom, the fungi, have often slipped through the cracks of what our ideas about what nature is, about how we practice conservation. So I'm really thrilled that you've included fungi as part of the series. So today I just basically wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction as to what these organisms are, why they matter, how we can conserve them, and how we can include them in our conservation programs. And rather than do a PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to keep it a little more analogue. And I've been out in the forest this morning and I've had a wander around and I've picked up a few different specimens. So I'm going to do a bit of a show and tell today and show you some of these specimens rather than actually do a PowerPoint presentation. I hope you can see those okay there now. So this title of the seminar interested me from little things because we often, we see a fungus and we see this tiny little organism and it seems quite a small and an insignificant thing. But the thing to keep in mind when we're looking at fungi is that what we're seeing in the reproductive structure, what we commonly call a mushroom, is just the reproductive part. So this is a bit like the equivalent of a flower in plants or genitalia in an animal. We commonly call this a mushroom, this typical umbrella-shaped form, this cap and stalk style form. The technical term is a sporophore. A sporophore just means a spore-bearing or spore-holding container, spore-bearing organ or body. But sporophores come in all sorts of forms other than just the mushroom-shaped form, such as puffballs. I'm sure you're all familiar with the puffballs that you often see growing alongside the road. A lot of them in the Wimmera region, often in drier environments but also things such as the lichens, which people commonly think of as plants, but lichens are actually classified as fungi as well. But the organism itself, this is just the organ of the organism, so to speak. The organism, the fungus organism itself, exists as this amazing matrix or tapestry of these long cells called hyphae, singular hypha, plural hyphae, that branch, and form this amazing tapestry or network in soils or in organic matter. I'm sure you've all seen this when you've scratched around in the leaf litter or the compost heap. This is the actual growing feeding part of the fungus organism. And when we see the mushroom or other sporophore form, this is just the, the reproductive part. So this is the organism itself. So I thought this idea of from little things is the title. Some, the, the mycelium of some fungi might only be a few millimetres big, 
but the mycelium of other fungi can be incredibly vast. In fact, we know of some that are thousands of acres big. So I love this notion of thinking of, you probably heard the term, the wood wide web that was popularized by the German forester, Peter Wolleben, who popularized the work of the British Columbian mycologist, Suzanne Simard in his book, The Secret Life of Plants. And the idea is that the under the soil, we had this network almost like an internet of communication of fungal mycelium, because we know that over 90% of plants actually form a relationship with the fungus mycelium. And Nushka just talked to us about the orchid mycorrhizas, but there's all kinds of other mycorrhizas as well. So for me to think of biodiversity as just flora and fauna and not fungi is a very strange way of thinking because we have to think about not just different types of organisms, but the interconnectivities between them. And this is, I think, why fungi have been particularly fascinating for me. I actually come from a background in freshwater ecology, but over the last 25 years or so, I've been looking more closely at fungi because I'm interested in processes and connectivities and communication. And what's been really exciting for me is it's quite a transitional time. For a long time in Australia and also other English speaking nations, such as the United States and the United Kingdom, we were regarded as being quite mycophobic, that is fearing of fungi. But I've seen just in the last three or four years, over the last 10 years, but particularly the last three or four years, this shift in our thinking in Australia, this move from being a bit fearing and a bit skeptical about fungi toward this real embracing of them. And not just by scientists and ecologists, but particularly by farmers. And to me, this is very exciting, given that most of the land in this country is privately owned and in farming. So I'm very excited to see farmers saying, how can we get fungi back on the land? How can we encourage fungi back into our agro ecosystems? Because what fungi do is predominantly they recycle. We think of plants as producers. We think about animals as consumers but the fungi are the great recyclers. So when a leaf or a stick falls to the forest floor, there'll be three different groups of organisms that will act upon that to recycle that, turn it back into soil again. We call this process pedogenesis, this transformation from organic matter back into soil. We have bacteria, we have invertebrates, that is all those little spineless creatures, and we have fungi. And the invertebrates do it mechanically by biting into the organic matter with their mandibles or their mouth parts and mechanically breaking it down into many pieces. But the fungi do it chemically by the secretion of enzymes. So this mycelium here in this piece of bark, it's actually feeding on it by secreting enzymes that can break down things like the lignin and cellulose that give this wood its hardness. And while those invertebrates can break it down physically into little pieces, only fungi can break down chitin through these enzymes, through this chemical digestive enzymes, breaking that down. So what farmers recognise is that the mycelium is actually recycling, making those nutrients biologically available, but mycelium also creates architecture in soil. So if you can imagine this network of fibres, they actually hold the soil particles apart. They create interstitial spaces, little gaps and crevices in between the particles of soil and dirt. And what that does is it makes gaps, it makes spaces, so the soil is aerated, it's aerobic. It then becomes inhabitable for other creatures like invertebrates to actually live in and occupy and inhabit their soil. And then by their movements through the soil, they create more spaces, more gaps, more recycling. By holding the soil apart, this also allows water to very gently trickle down through the soil to the deeper horizons in the soil. So unlike soil that doesn't have air spaces, it becomes compacted and depending whether it's colloidal, how much clay or how much sand is in it, when it rains, the water either just runs off or it becomes waterlogged. But by having that fungal mycelium in the soil, you get, get this lovely trickling of water through the soil. So the mycelium creates air spaces, creates structure, allows water to filtrate very gently, but also through these mycorrhizal relationships, like the ones Nushka mentioned, myco meaning fungus, rhizo meaning root, what actually happens is that the fungus, the mycelium, is much, much finer than even the finest root of a plant. What that means is it can penetrate all these interstitial spaces. It can be much more exploitative than a plant root on its own. 
The fungus forms a sheath around the plant's root or actually enters the cortical cells of the root and effectively extends out the plant's root system. And we know that for some plants, they can inc increase the absorbable area of the plant root system by over a thousand times, which is just astonishing. Think about how much more water that plant can now obtain because of that increased absorbable surface area. And the fungus can find its way into all those little cracks and crevices, return water to the plant, but also selectively uptake nutrients that the plants need. So many of our crop species receive NPK, nitrates, phosphates and potassium. But plants often need more than just nitrates, phosphates and potassium. Perhaps they need zinc or boron or selenium. And that's what fungi can do. They can actually return many more types of nutrients and minerals to the plant than the plant can access on their own. So for all this work that the fungus does, attracting more water, bringing water back to the plant, bringing more nutrients back to the plant, in return, the plant gives the fungus a lovely feed of sugars that it produces through photosynthesis. And we call this a mutually beneficial mycorrhizal symbiosis. So it's a two-way mutually beneficial relationship. And we know that most plants, over 300,000 species of plants worldwide, form these relationships with over 50,000 species of fungi. And I often think to our conservation practices and, and how we have things called red lists. I'm sure you've all heard of, of red lists. In Australia, we have things like the EPBC Act, the Environment and Biodiversity Protection Conservation Act. And in Victoria, we have the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. Incidentally, Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. There seems to be an F missing there. Maybe we need to change the name of that to the Flora, Fauna and Fungi Guarantee Act. But we have lists of species that are endangered in some way, at risk of extinction perhaps. But if we list a Fascogale on there or a particular orchid on there, unless we list the fungus species associated with it, we're only doing half the job. So I think our ways of, of thinking about conservation are changing, that organisms don't exist in isolation. They exist in association with other species. As I mentioned, over 90% of plants exist with particular fungi. And we might list that endangered betong, but we know that in this time of year, particularly in autumn, that a huge part of a betong's diet, or a potteroos, or a wallabies, or an antichinus, is truffle fungi, underground fungi. So I think our thinking is changing where we're not just listing species as isolated individuals or individual species, but we're trying to accommodate their food sources, their habitats, and the thinking about conservation is becoming much broader. It's looking at all those interactions, those symbioses and habitat protection at the fore. So when we're thinking about fungi, remember that the actual mycelium is under the soil or in the tree or in the wallaby scat. And that's the actual organism. And this is just the, the reproductive structure. So this kind of mushroom, we're all pretty familiar with. It has these lovely lamellae on the underside, or they're sometimes called gills. I'm not quite sure why they're called gills. Perhaps the first uh, scientist who tried to, to look at fungi thought it was a fish rather than fungus and called them gills. But anyway, lamellae, gills, whatever you call them. This is the most, I guess, familiar fungus that has the radiating lamellae on the underside. But other fungi have other strategies for dispersing their spores. And you can see this one here actually has pores on the underside. That's P-O-R-E-S, not P-A-W-S. If you've got P-A-W-S on the end of your, on the underside of your mushroom, you probably picked up the dog, not a fungus. So some fungi have pores, and each pore is the opening of a little tube, and inside the tube are the spores. This particular one is called Swillus luteus. You can see this very glutinous, gloopy surface, which is characteristic of this genus. This actually is an edible fungus. And you can see here, this one grows in these mycorrhizal associations with the genus Pinus, pine trees. But not all fungi have this cap and stalk style arrangement. Here's one more little cluster, actually, that was growing on a old birch, I think it was. This one's called Flamulina veloptepes, another edible species. But other fungi, as I mentioned, manifest, for example, as puffballs. And this is essentially just a ball full of spores. This is a numbers game. So when this is ripe and the spores are ripe, it essentially just cracks open and the spores are blown away. If I do a cross section of this one, you can see inside this astonishing patterning of the locules where the spores are, just stunningly beautiful things. I think it's actually the aesthetics of fungi that first drew me toward them 
and then that took me to the science of fungi. You can see here I've got another little puffball. This one's called like a purden, and you can see here in its mature stage, it forms this little opening where the spores puff out from. And this needs a drop of rain to actually land on the ball and the pressure of that raindrop or that insect puffs out the spores. You can probably see this now, I've just completely filled my room and my computer with spores. Then we have other fungi that don't form anything as dramatic as a puff ball or an umbrella shaped mushroom. And you can see this stunning thing here that just forms like a, a sheath or a paint like structure on the underside of this wood. And again, remember that the mycelium itself is actually inside this piece of wood. This is just the reproductive structure and the whole surface here is actually fertile. There's tiny little holes that the spores are released from. You might also have seen some fungi growing like a, 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 she, a, a sheath or a shelf, I should say, out of the side of trees. These are known as bracket fungi or polypores, meaning many pores. This particular one, which was called Pycnoporus conchinus, till quite recently, it's just become Trametis, the genus has changed. This is a particularly interesting one because it's one of the few species that we know was used by Aboriginal people, particularly the Wiradjuri, who knew about its antibiotic compounds, and they used this to cure ulcers in the mouth or cuts or sores in the mouth, and they gave it to young babies or children as a teething ring to protect those young mouth and gums as the teeth were pushing through. And some of you might even have seen something like this on the forest floor, which looks a bit like an old piece of polystyrene. What this one is, is the remains of a bracket fungus known as a punk, Latiporus portentosus, or the white punk, which again grows like a bracket or a, a, a semicircle arc coming out of the side of the tree. And this one with the recent rains, it's actually filled up like a sponge and the weight of it's ripped it off the tree. And this is another interesting one as well, because it was also used by Aboriginal people as a source of kindling to light fires, also to carry fire, to translocate fire from one place to another. And it was also used as a source of light. So if we were to ignite this, it burns very, very slowly, gives off this glow and is a fantastic source of light. So while we only have very scant understanding of Aboriginal use of fungi because most of that wasn't actually recorded in a written format, it was oral, is, is oral, I should say, we do know of a few local species that have Aboriginal significance. And then, of course, these amazing things, the lichens, are probably one of the best known groups of fungi in Australia. And every lichen is a symbiosis between a fungus and an alga or multiple algae and other organisms as well, such as yeasts. And you can see here the little reproductive structures of the lichen. And we've got other types of lichens like this one here, this beautiful coral lichen you will find throughout the Wimmera. This is one of the drier inland species. And lichens were one of the, the first, our first understanding of the nature of symbiosis goes back to the German scientist Anton de Barry, also Simon Schwenender, who recognised that fungi weren't plants, that they were, actually were symbiotic. They were multiple organisms living together and both benefiting from this dual arrangement. And what's interesting, when I studied botany and zoology, there was no mycology back in the Pleistocene. I uh, learned that there was this particular strategy called symbiosis, that some animals and plants exploit this idea of living together and, and doubling up on your talents. But I thought this, this isn't a secondary strategy. It's very hard to think of anything that isn't symbiotic. There's very few organisms, if any, that can live in isolation. We know that we're symbiotic with all kinds of gut bacteria and, and other creatures. And I, pre I think pretty much if you took any organism, you'd recognize it lives in association with something else. So we know now that symbioses aren't a secondary, ex secondary strategy, they are the norm. And I think that's why it's so important in the way that we approach conservation or land rehabilitation, that we think about these connectivities. And Nushka told us that the success of her program hinges very much on thinking about the pollinators and the mycorrhizal fungi and that those orchids rely 100% on having both the mycorrhizal fungi and the pollinator. So for me, this is very exciting. And I think it's these connectivities, these associations that make fungi particularly fascinating. Some of the others, this is another little bracket fungus that you might have seen around, stunningly beautiful thing. 
known as the rainbow fungus. It's not hard to see where it gets its name. Or Trometes versicolor, versicolor meaning many different uh, colors. And this one's also, again, known for its antibiotic properties. It's very commonly used in traditional Tibetan and Chinese medicine. In fact, it's grown worldwide for that reason, particularly. You can see the porous undersurface here, always growing on wood. And particular fungi also grow in particular, not just habitats, but particular substrate types. So those mycorrhizal fungi that form relationships with trees, such as the swillus I mentioned earlier, swillus luteus, and there's many that form mycorrhizal relationships with eucalypts, dozens of different fungi, such as the genus Ammonita, Rusula, Lactarius, form relationships with eucalyptus, for example, the Tasmanian blue gum, eucalyptus globulus, forms relationships with a couple of dozen different fungus species. So you can imagine how much more successful those blue gum plantations are when they have those mycorrhizal fungi accessing nutrients, accessing water, also fighting off pathogens in the soil. So the fungi do an incredible amount to benefit the tree's resilience and health and growth. So along with the lichens, the bracket fungi, we've also got little things like this little disc fungus here. And somebody mentioned fire in the, in the context of orchids before. And what's interesting is that after fire, when depending on the intensity and the extent of the fire, some fungi will be wiped out completely. The mycorrhizae, mycorrhizas will be destroyed. The spores in the spore bank in the soil will be destroyed. But like animals and plants, some fungi are specifically adapted to deal with fire. And it's interesting, I was down in the Brisbane Ranges a few years back when some fires had gone through there and everything was black, completely black, really catastrophic fire. It was still almost smoking. And then I looked closely and there was this orange shimmer, this orange haze on the soil. And I realised that it was actually this tiny little disc fungi called anthrosobia. We call these pyrophilus fungi, fire-loving fungi. And they were the very first colonisers after this almost total mass destruction it was the fungi, and I love to think of them almost a bit like the SES after there's been some kind of the state emergency service, some kind of upheaval or disruption or disaster. The fungi are moving in. They're there putting that structure back in the soil, putting that mycorrhizal network back in the soil, soil, creating stability. And then if a bird flies over and excretes a seed, when that seed lands, there's a little bit more structure in the soil. There's a, a little bit more recycling going on, the fungi are making that soil inhabitable again for a seed to germinate. So fungi are often some of the very first colonizers after fire, not just fire. Also, if you see road works that have been done or logging, again, the fungi are there trying to put that structure, not I'm saying trying, I don't mean they're literally consciously trying to do that, but that's what they do. Bare soil very rarely exists in nature. And as soon as soil becomes bare, you've got fungi and other crust forming species and plants trying to get that stability back into the soil again. So fungi are doing a lot. They're putting structure in soils, they're forming connections with plants, they're increasing the resilience and health of plants, they're filtering water, they're also providing food for homo sapiens. So I've also noticed that foraging is on the increase in Australia. We don't tend to have that um, history that you see in European countries of foraging, but that's just starting to change here in Australia. Although we do have to be pretty careful because we do have some deadly toxic species as well. Dean, I've lost complete track of what time I've started. Have I used up my time frame, or how are we going for time? Uh, so, uh, Alison, we're, we're pretty close to time, but uh, okay. there's a few comments in the chat about how engaging and interesting you are. Oh, thank so, you. Um, we, we could jump to a few questions or sure, if you have another couple of okay certainly um, let's have some questions it, there, there's been quite a lot of uh uh i've just lost my mouse uh there's been quite a lot of questions uh come up so i'll try and pick out some of the more popular ones sure there was a few there's been a few comments about um you you mentioned symbiosis with uh vascular plants and uh a question about um, and the puffball was the 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 spores were very obvious when you when you puffed them. Um, could you comment on any sort of advantage for revegetation or land management projects for actually physically spreading the the spores or the 
uh, the, the mushroom structures in, in new areas. Certainly. So oftentimes I get asked, shall we cut up the mushroom and sprinkle it around and, and help it distribute? Certainly we can do that, although fungi have been around since the Devonian. I think they're, they're pretty good at doing it without it. So the best thing we can do for fungi is, one, is to maximise the diversity of the habitats. So when you're revegetating, don't chip all the organic matter. Don't chip it all into one centimetre square pieces. Some fungi are happy to live on a one centimetre square wood chip, but others want to live on an old log. Some want to live in a piece of bark. Some want to live on a small stick. Some fungi like this one here has chosen this gum leaf to live on. So the more diversity in size of the organic matter, species and age. So if you can get diversity in age, size and, and species, you'll then provide the habitats for a greater diversity of fungi. In the same way that we all don't want to live in apartments, some of us want to live in beach houses or tents, or tents fungi like different substrate types and habitats as well. So when you're vegetating, don't chip everything. Try and keep a diversity of different organic matter. And the second thing to do is try and minimise the stresses, the things that fungi don't like. So fungi don't like too much disturbance. If you shove a, a spade through the mycelium, it's gossamer thin. You actually break it. You destroy the organism. If you've damaged too much of it, you'll kill it. So try to think about minimising the level of disturbance. They also don't like compaction. If you crush mycelium, you'll kill the organism. So try and minimise the amount of heavy machinery and equipment and driving over the area that you're rehabilitating. Also try and minimise the amount of fire, the amount of chemicals, and any overwatering or over irrigation, all those things will wipe out some of the fungi that are less resilient to those things. So rather than trying to actively just spread the puffballs around, they'll, they'll come. If you provide the habitat, the diversity of habitats, and minimise the stresses, the fungi will come. You don't need to go around throwing the fungi around. They'll be there. Spores are ubiquitous. There's spores everywhere now, including all over me in my room. There's probably fungi spores all over my hand. I haven't got a deep enough leaf little layer for those to actually form a mycelium. But if you actually provide those habitat types, reduce the stresses, you'll get the fungi along. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Alison. Um, a few people, you, I think you mentioned uh, pathogenic fungus. Uh, a couple of people are interested in the I interactions between things like honey fungus and uh, cinnamon fungus, Phytophthora. Sure. So it's widespread in the in the Grampians, and okay. how they interact with the the good fungus. Sure. So the way I look at it, the, the binary of good fungus, bad fungus, is is rather sort of a, a simple one, and I think. Often we confuse cause and effects. So, and, and for a start, I'll just say that Phytophthora actually isn't a fungus. Technically, it's a fungus-like organism. And I like to, to split hyphae <laughs> here because anything that we think of as bad or destructive gets thrown in this basket called bad fungi. So, and things like Armillaria, the one you mentioned, the honey fungus, this can be a very destructive fungus if we mismanage the environments where we eliminate all of the other fungi that keep it in check. So if you walk through a forest, I bet where you'll find both Phytophthora, which is not a fungus, and our malaria will be where the logging trucks have gone through. So wherever we've caused, caused disturbance and we've had poor forest management, what we've done is we've removed all these other fungi because of those stresses I just mentioned. If we compress soil, if we use fire in the wrong way, if we use chemicals, we wipe out those fungi that are more sensitive that actually keep honey fungus in check. There's honey fungus everywhere. Armillaria is everywhere. It's only when we weaken the resilience or health of the ecosystem that the honey fungus goes, oh, great, all my competitors are gone. I'm just going to wipe out all these trees. It can be a very destructive fungus. But I think we have to think of it as a symptom of mismanagement, not as a cause of a problem. And I think when we think about, oh, this species is out of control, I mean, think about potato blight. Think about spots on your roses. The spot on the rose isn't the problem. The monoculture of roses that we create that he wanted to feed on is the problem. So I think we sort of have to look at our own role here and how we, you know, keeping diversity is key in everything. And if you maintain that diversity of fungi by having different habitat types, minimising stresses, then those more pathogenic fungi will be kept in check. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, there, there's a question here that I, I find interesting. 
about, uh, uh, I'm presuming, freshwater crayfish and been major burrowers and perhaps been uh, playing a role in spreading of fungal spores? Ah, very interesting. I think all burrowing animals could be. I mean, I think everything from a, a worm through to a, a wallaby that's burrowing for, for truffles, through to wombats, through to crayfish. I think all these, what we, what we often call ecosystem engineers, all have a role in spreading spores. And that's why when we fragment habitats, when we, when forested areas get broken up by farmland or developed areas, what actually happens is we lose the vectors. So the, the betongs, for example, are the vectors of the fungal spores. They eat the truffles, they bounce off and secrete or excrete the fungal spores. And say if we lose those ecosystem engineers, such as the crayfish, I think this is why it's so important to keep that complexity, that diversity across kingdoms, but also to keep those corridors to try and link up those patches of isolated bush. I mean, if you've got a, a an isolated spot where there's no truffle eating mammals, there's not going to be any truffles. So yeah. I think that's really critical. And I think we're doing that very much now with our conservation. We're recognising the importance of, you know, linking up those patches of forested area through farmland. Okay. And uh, Alison, we've got a, a couple of questions about uh, herbicides and fungicides. Uh, and fungicides, particularly in relation to uh, rust in, I'm going to say, cereal crops sure. and how that might impact our soil fungi? Yeah, look, great yes. question. The, the, what we call the arbuscular fungi, the, the mycorrhizal fungi that form relationships with crops are typically micro fungi, and I tend to work more with the macro fungi, so I'm certainly no expert on that. But certainly, I'm not sure how specific those fungicides are, whether they are, are very specific to particular rusts or other microfungi, or whether they have a, a greater impact beyond those particular species. A lot of work's been done on that at the Orange Agricultural Institute. So there's quite, most of our research in Australia is actually on fungi of economic importance. So ones that affect our particular cereal crops. So I'm, I'm also the ecologist with macrofungi. So I think somewhere like the Orange Agricultural Institute or even maybe the ANVG, oh, maybe not ANVG, but there's certainly a lot of information online about fungicides, but I've seen this real shift with regenerative farmers who recognise if they can get enough diversity back in their agricultural soils, they've radically reduced the need for fungicides and other kinds of chemicals to, to control pathogenic species. Uh, th thank you, Alison. And the questions are coming through quick and fast. Um, uh, a question from, I presume, one of our YouTube uh, viewers is uh, about the benefit of, and forgive me for saying this poorly, but psilocybin? Yeah, wow. No, you said, said that spot on. So this is a, a, a genus, psilocybin is a genus of fungi that are known for their psychotropic properties, hallucinogenic properties. And it is actually classified as a class one drug in Australia, so it is illegal to use them. But there's been a whole new area of research We've got a researcher at Monash University who's looking at the use of psilocybin for the treatment of depression and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're now recognising often things, I mean, it's technically a neurotoxin, but oftentimes every toxin has a medicinal benefit. So we're now recognising that psilocybin could have great potential to help, help people with mental health problems. And this has actually been known for years. It's gone back, goes back 50 or 60 years that this was isolated back then. But I think only now are we recognising with mental health issues on the increase that we really need to look at some of these amazing natural products we've had. So you might want to have a look at some of the work that's happening at Monash Uni. Yeah, great. And uh, I might uh, just, I'll close out with, with one more question. Uh, we have a question about uh, luminescence in, in fungi and if that's some sort of evolutionary advantage. Oh, well, wonderful. Why is a fungi luminescent? Look, I think that it's really to help the wombats to find their way through the forest at night. Um, so one fungus we know of called Omphalotus nidiformis, or the ghost fungus, very, very common in temperate Australia. You'll find it growing on the bases of eucalypt stumps, also pine stumps. In fact, our first example of mycotourism in South Australia is to go on ghost fungus tours to take people to go out and see them. 
And originally we thought perhaps there was some kind of nocturnal vector, like a, a moth or some kind of mammal that helped with the distribution of spores. But we since have found out that just as many insects or nocturnal animals are visiting the fungi that don't buy luminesce. So we actually think it's nothing to do with spore distribution. And probably the unsexy scientific answer is it's some kind of secondary byproduct. But I still like to think that it's to help the wombats find their way. Yeah, fair, fair enough. That, that's a good thing. Um, th thank you, Alison. That was fantastic. And um, if you uh, ha had an opportunity to have a look at the, the chat column, there's a lot of very positive comments about um, how engaging you've been and how interesting you've made uh, a fungi for everybody. So I think everybody's really appreciated you being here today. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of your wonderful seminar series. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Um, so uh, th thank you, everybody. I, I just wanted to uh, cover off on, um, a th thank you again to, to Nushka and Alison. That was uh, two re really great presentations. I think that um, uh, I know I've been in the game for a while. I've learnt a lot this morning, and I think that's a really uh, a really positive thing. I'm uh, sorry we didn't quite get to all the questions that were uh, posted for for both presentations, but um, uh, hopefully all our attendees are inspired to go and uh, search out a bit more information uh, on themselves and. Of course, Google's a wonderful resource for, for that uh, for, from that point of view. And I'll I'll borrow a few words from uh, Bianca, one of the other organisers. That this is a, a wonderful way to finish off the seminar for for this year. And uh, yeah, fa fabulous presentations that we've had uh, today. In closing out uh, today's uh, seminar. I'd like to uh, just make a, a quick mention and of uh, next year's seminar, and uh, potentially, uh, potentially things will be more or less back to normal this time next year in, in relation to uh, COVID nineteen, and I think the organising community will will plan to go ahead in our more traditional format in early September uh, 2021. So having live speakers in front of a live audience, a tour in the afternoon and a dinner in the evening, uh, as we've done 20 something times or, already. And uh, anyone who's registered for uh, these online seminars will receive information about the 2021 seminar early in the, uh, in the new year which really doesn't seem that far away anymore. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, the members of the organising committee who've done a great job with the technology over these past five weeks. And uh, I'll just mention everybody by name quickly. Uh, Pauline Rudolph, Annie Hobie, Bianca Gold, Melissa Douglas, Ben Holmes, Caitlin Braden, Yoni Tiljak, Andrea Mitchell, Laverne Lehman and Matthew Bliss. And um, uh, for myself, Dean Robertson, uh, I feel like I, I've coasted along this year on the coattails of, of other people, but it's been a, uh, a really interesting seminar and it's been great that we've been able to uh, keep, keep the biodiversity seminars going while uh, we've had these restrictions in, in the rest of our lives. So it's a, it, it's a great thing. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining today and for, for joining over the past few weeks. And uh, I'll say goodbye from the, the 2020 Wimra Biodiversity Seminar. Thank you very much.